starts digging deep. <laughs> well, I turned the lights on, I unlocked the doors, and everyone's in here. My job is done now. <laughs> Let's bow for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can come and meet. We thank you for the freedom in this country that we can do such. We thank you for the testimony of this church and for all the people that attend and help out in different ways. We pray that you would be with our speaker and that you would uh, let the Holy Spirit put the words in his mouth and uh, just speak to us because we know that you are here in our midst. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Okay. Let's turn to page 56. <laughs> Turn to page 56. 56. We'll sing the first and the last verse. And let's all stand. Oh, and uh, 
Her broken back is coming along. She's in a full body cast. Okay. Right? And what you doing about it? Okay. Thank you. Yes. And that's your sister, right? Yep. Another announcement? Is there another one? I thought I saw two hands up. No, I was just me pointing it here. Oh, okay. <laughs> Any other announcements? Okay. So we will have the greeting hand. Page 100 for the greeting hymn. We'll just sing the first verse. <laughs> but there's only one verse. <laughs>
party. Good, man.
person who's been in front of her. And his name is Mac Pitchkin, right? Mac. And he's going to give us a little. Preview of his trip to Uganda and tell us what's in store for him down the road before his <clears throat> Yes, uh, my wife and I are uh, returning actually to Uganda. Uh, we were there 35 years ago. Uh, you were much younger then. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so we, we said, uh, well, it's only taken us 35 years to get back, because we wanted to go again. Uh, we took our three sons uh, with us that trip, and now they were that tall then, and they're that tall now. Uh, but uh, uh, spent some time uh, in both Kenya and Uganda last time. This time we're going to Uganda only. Uh, we're going with uh, uh, pastor, retired school teacher Bob Schooley from Pioneer School, if you know, know the name. Anyways, he's been there. This will be his 20th trip to Uganda. And they, they're, God's doing some amazing things there, like drilling wells and, and building uh, schools and digging latrines. Uh, that's always exciting work. <laughs> and uh, uh, providing like uh, birthing kits for uh, women to give birth on because they need some sanitary surroundings for birthing and uh, providing uh, mosquito netting and et cetera, et cetera. I'll be doing basically uh, Bible teaching to folks uh, in Uganda in four different locations. My wife, who uh, is a quilter, sewer, all, that, all those kinds of things, she'll be teaching women uh, sewing so that they can make things and sell them and feed their families. So we'll be doing that for two weeks. Uh, 35 years ago, we went for a month. Uh, we didn't figure we could uh, make it a month uh, at our old age. So we decided two weeks this time, see how it goes. So thank you for, and that will be September uh, 14 through the end of, of the month. So if you think of us, uh, pray for us, my wife Gwen and I and Bob and and Glenn, uh, four of us are going this, this time. Uh, Pastor Duff also wanted me to uh, tell you, remind you, uh, uh, what uh, God is doing uh, in my life, through my life, uh, in regards to ministry. Uh, retired as a pastor, if you can retire as a pastor, I don't know if you can or not, but I'm an elder at a church in Machias. Anybody know where Machias is? <laughs> Lion Lake, all right? So I'm an elder there, not the pastor, not an elder, uh, elder in more ways than one, I'm afraid. <laughs> and uh, so uh, uh, I'm also the adult Sunday school teacher, my wife is the treasurer, uh, I help with the youth group, uh, etc. And I'm also the chaplain for the Wyoming County Sheriff's Department and the chaplain at the jail. And I lead the Board of Supervisors, the Wyoming County Board of Supervisors, in prayer before their monthly meetings. Uh, that is a great opportunity to get to know all the supervisors. And uh, do you know who your supervisor is, by the way? Hmm? Nope. Nope. <laughs> what town is this? What are you doing in your spare time? <laughs> I play with my grandkids. <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure who your supervisor is either. You know you have one, right? You, you. David Granger, Gainesville. Is it David Granger? All right, so. Yeah. Okay, okay, for Gainesville, yes. right? David is actually on our uh, jail committee uh, himself also. So, yeah, good, good guy. So anyways, that's, that's mm. what I do. In uh, my spare time, I do, do some camping and play with the grandkids and Anything else I can do to keep myself occupied? Stay out of trouble. Uh, just came from Pike Fair, by the way. Noticed I uh, got my John Deere tie on. I <laughs> uh, had to wear that to the fair today because we have church. We, I'm a part of a pastor's group. 
It has a uh, uh, booth at the fair in the commercial building. Uh, those of you who are Republicans uh, might know, right, we're right next door to the Republican booth in the commercial building, the Green Building. And so we do all kinds of things there during the week, give away Bibles and, and make uh, little bracelets and things like that. You'll have to stop by this week to make a bracelet. We're also doing walking sticks this year. Anybody need a walking stick? <laughs> uh, <right? laughs> so, anyways, that we have a church service at the fair on Sunday morning. So I came from there. Uh, guess what our first song was? To God be the glory. To God be the glory. <laughs> I get it, God. I get it. I get it. All right, so come to the fair. It's a fair fair. <laughs> so turn with me in your Bibles to the Revelation. I don't know about you. Uh, I, I like to read, but uh, it, does, it takes a long time to read a book, doesn't it? So I like to read the last chapter first. So uh, <laughs> my wife says, shame on you. I can't do that. Uh, she's a retired, well, not retired. She's retired again, librarian. So anyways, uh, the Revelation, uh, notice it's not Revelations, plural. This is the Revelation. The Revelation of a person whose name is, guess what? Jesus, right? Right? So, the Revelation, chapter 19. I'm going to read a couple of verses here, 7 through 9. Well, by the way, uh, Pastor Duff, I sent Pastor Duff a copy of my sermon notes. Those might be back there. I'm not sure he said he was going to make copies. So, if you want a copy uh, for yourself, uh, please uh, take, take a couple. You can at least start a fire with them. <laughs> All right. So, anyways... Uh, uh, John saw some great things uh, there on the island of Patmos, and uh, so one of the things he saw uh, was here uh, described in uh, 1970. So let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, to God be the glory, great things, right? For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. Amen. And to her, his wife, it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. All right, so keep that in mind, especially that phrase, his wife, the bride. Uh, would the bride of Christ please raise her hand? Now, I know, guys, that's a difficult concept, right? To think that, that you're the bride. <laughs> but when it comes to our, our, our groom, our husband, who is who? Jesus. Jesus. We are his bride. Every one of us. All right? So don't get hung up on other things there. The bride of Christ has made, is, is making herself ready. All right. And so now uh, turn over a few books to Ephesians. Got to turn left and go to Ephesians. And then you're familiar with this passage, especially with those who are married. Uh, maybe the most challenging uh, scripture in the whole Bible about marriage and about being husbands and wives. Uh, however, that's a topic for another day. But I am going to begin with uh, verse uh, 26. Well, I'm going to start with 25, okay? Husbands, love your wives. What chapter? This is, a, I'm sorry, chapter 5. Ephesians 5. Thank you, thank you for reminding me where I'm at here. Ephesians 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. What did Jesus do for her, the church? He gave himself for her, right? That, in order that, verse 26, 
he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church. What kind of a church? A glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Amen. A glorious church without spot or wrinkle, washed in the blood of the Lamb. That's you. That's me. That's us and is it us and you guys? <laughs> you you <and> <laughs> say that's me. That's me. That's me. A glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. And then uh, lastly, uh, and here's the text: Hosea. Hosea. Now they call that they call these last few prophets of the Old Testament minor prophets. I don't know why they call them minor prophets because maybe they're short. The books are short. Uh, Hosea might be the longest of all the minor prophets. But anyways, Hosea chapter ten. Hosea. Ho ho ho. When was the last time you read Hosea? <laughs> I know. I, know. <clears throat> I love the book of Hosea, and I'll tell you why later. <clears throat> All right, so Hosea chapter 10, I'm going to read a few verses here 10 through 15, uh, 12 through 15. Hosea 10, 12 through 15. I already had the water guy. Move some water. I was just at a, a camp with my daughter and her church out in uh, Seneca Lake. <clears throat> Guess what it did on Friday? It rained. <laughs> and rain and rain and rain. Some people who were tenting, they had rivers running through their tents. Uh, anyways, I was the Bible teacher for the week and uh, Guess what my theme was? Water. <laughs> they said, this is your fault. <laughs> All right. So, verse 12. Sow for yourselves righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fellow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. You have Cloud wickedness. Verse 13. You have reaped iniquity. You have eaten the fruit of lies because you trusted in your own way in the multitude of your mighty men. Therefore, tumult shall arise among your people, and all your fortresses shall be plundered, as Shalman plundered Beth Arbal in the day of battle, a mother dashed in pieces upon her children. Thus it shall be done to you, O Bethel, because of your great wickedness. At dawn, the king of Israel shall be cut off utterly. You know, these, old, these minor prophets, they just said it like it is. Did they not? So here's Hosea saying, folks, you've got a problem. This is what you need to do to solve the problem. So, the bride has made herself ready. That's where I'm headed. The bride. The glorious church. That's you. That's me. The bride. Let the church be the church. Let the people rejoice. That's a Gator song. The old man John saw many things as Jesus revealed himself to himself to John on the island of Patmos. John is shown, has is shown two women he describes in Revelation 19. The first is the great harlot, who is surrounded by the judgment of fire. What is this judgment about, you ask? 
It's about the corruption of mankind by this harlot. And even for the shedding of the blood of God's people at her hands. The other woman John sees is the glorious bride, the wife of Jesus, who is surrounded not by the fire of judgment, but by the sounds of hallelujahs with gladness and rejoicing as this marriage of Jesus and his bride, the church, is celebrated. What is this celebration about? It's about the bride who has made herself ready. Ready for her groom, having clothed herself in fine linen, clean and bright. The bride's attire is reminiscent of the brightness, the, the brightness of Jesus' clothing as he is transfigured before Moses and Elijah and Peter and James and John on that mountain in Mark chapter 9. Mark writing that Jesus' clothing was brighter than any earthly laundry could wash them. Even the glorious supernatural angels that were often seen by men and women described in scripture being clothed in pure brightness. As described by John in Revelation chapter 15. Come on, make yourself a note. They are, they, that, the brightness of those angels is dull compared to the brightness of the bride of Christ. The lovers of that great harlot were at one time dressed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. As John saw and described in Revelation 18, yet in one hour, one hour, all that supposed glory came to nothing. As John describes in verse 17, the so-called glory of the harlot was temporary as she and her lovers will spend eternity in the judgment of eternal separation that the Bible refers to as hell. The bride of Jesus will, on the other hand, enter into the very presence of God as a bride adorned for her husband <laughs> As John describes in Revelation 21 and 22, don't stop with chapter 19, read on. Because John describes greater pictures, word pictures of things that he saw concerning the bride. So, this being said, how is it that the bride of Jesus, the church, makes herself ready for her husband? Glad you asked. Well, the Apostle Paul gives us a glimpse of how that happens in Ephesians chapter 5. Point number one from Ephesians chapter 5. One, the foundation for that readiness, the readiness of the bride, the glorious church, the foundation for that readiness is that Jesus, our husband, loved the church and gave himself up for her. Aren't you glad? Come on now. Aren't you glad? He loves the church. I know the church this day, these days has all kinds of problems because it has me in it. I know, by the way, you. Right? The church today has problems. But the Savior, our groom, our husband, is the solver of problems. He's the transformer. So, but yet, the foundation for our readiness is not me, it's not my John Deere tie. The foundation is his great love for me in spite of me and you. And he gave himself for you. You know that, right? He gave himself away for you. Number two, she, that is the bride, makes herself ready by the sanctifying and cleansing work of Jesus, her husband. You see, it is a, a work of, of, our, of our groom, of our husband. He, he's at work in us. He's at work in his church. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. He's at work. Well, sometimes we wonder, 
Lord, what are, are you? What are you doing? I mean, when uh, when you when you look at the the, the church, you say, "Wow, what are you are you doing anything these days, Jesus?" Our room, because you know the world's waiting is looking for the church to be the church to reveal His glory to our world. So she makes herself ready by the sanctifying, setting apart, cleansing work of Jesus. That's what he's up to in you. That's what he's up to in me. He's setting us apart for himself, cleansing us. And so how does he do this? Number three, she makes herself, she, the bride, makes herself ready by the, by the way, by the, the washing of the water by the, with the Word by the book. You want to get washed, sanctified, set apart, cleansed? Get into this word every single day. That's how I start my day. You say, well, Matt, you're retired, you've got time to do that. Yeah, I make the time to do it. Five minutes of the washing word will transform any heart. Every single day, the washing of the water of the word. Get washed. That's what he's doing. He's washing his church, his bride. It, don't you love to be, to be clean? Mm -hmm. Washed? Mm -hmm. I, I grew up on a dairy farm and uh, uh, we, it was back in the day when we put in those small bales into the, into the barn and it was hot in there and hazy and sweaty and yeah at the end of the day you said well I'm ready for a shower or I'm ready to go jump in the pond <laughs> I, I need to get washed how great was that feeling right to get washed that's what he that's what he's up to he's washing his bride he does it so through his word <clears throat> and so the, and then point number four she makes herself ready as Jesus presents himself a glorious church bride without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. So uh, I know, guys, you've never been a bride. Am I? I, I, I believe I'm correct in that, right? Gentlemen, I've never been a bride. Uh, you know, here comes the bride, that kind of thing. But some of you ladies, you've been a bride. And so uh, what would you have thought if you, uh, you know, your mom said, Here's your wedding dress, and there's this big coffee stain on it. Oh. Or what, or groom? What would you have thought if your bride's coming down the aisle and he says, "What's that coffee stain on that beautiful white dress?" No, that that wouldn't be good, right? A, a spotless bride, uh, a dress that uh, no wrinkles. <laughs> that's the kind. Of, that's what. That's that's what he's doing. Without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Yeah. Anybody want to be that bride? Yeah. I want to be that bride. Making herself ready. Uh, so, and, and then number five, she makes herself ready by the work of Jesus, making her holy and without blemish. Yes. Aren't you glad? Come on now. That's what he's doing. Well, I don't feel it, I don't feel like it, I don't see it, you know. I... Who are you looking at? Looking at each other? Mm, don't look at me. <laughs> uh, look, look at him. Yeah, he's the one who makes us spotless and without blemish. He, he's the one. So you might be asking yourself, so was the Ephesian church, would, were they... Would they be described as a church like this? Well, if you're familiar with the book of Ephesians, you know that they had their problems, just like the church today. I hear people say, I want to find a New Testament church. Okay, well, uh, a New Testament church is one that had problems. <laughs> I mean, look at the Corinthian church. Oh, the Ephesian church wasn't much better. So the Ephesian church bride preparing herself for her groom, was, was she 
Was the Ephesian church doing that? Well, if you read the scripture prior to our focal passage, you'll read that there was a problem with the bride at Ephesus. For example, notice in chapter 4 of Ephesians, I know you've got to go backwards again, sorry. Chapter 4 of Ephesians, and I, and I won't take the time to uh, read this for you, uh, but uh, you notice that uh, uh, Paul describes them as being like children, tossed to and fro, carried about with, and this is chapter 4, verse 14, carried about with uh, every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Yikes! Is that, is that what's happening today? Yep. You betcha. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, that's exactly what's happening today. I don't have time to spend on this, but uh, I could spend quite a bit of time talking about what happened at the uh, Paris Olympics, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Right? trickery, the craftiness, the deception is running rampant in our world today. If the church doesn't know the truth, that's, that's why he goes on to say, but, verse 15, speaking the truth in love, they grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ. So anyways, the Ephesian church was, uh, they had ways to go just like me. You to be the church, to be the bride, the spotless, unblemished bride of Christ that has prepared herself for her groom. And this wasn't a new problem. It occurred over and over and over and over and over and over and over again with God's people. Throughout the Old Testament, you know it was true. Uh, many of the prophets of those days referred to God's people as, guess what? A harlot. Because they had other lovers. And so the prophets were saying over and over and over again, you've got to come back to your husband, the lover of your soul. He's first. Not all these other things. Not all these other gods. Not all this other stuff. And so you find that especially in the book of Hosea. Now you know the book of Hosea. You know the story, right? Of Hosea and Gomer. Well, whenever I think of the name Gomer, I think of Gomer Pilate. Shazam! <laughs> right? I like to think of Hosea's Gomer as Gomer. What do you think, ladies? <laughs> Hosea and Gomer. And you know the story, right? Uh, God says, hey, Hosea, hey, see, see Gomer over there? I want you to marry her. But Lord, she's a prostitute. I don't care. Go marry her. And so what does Hosea do? He goes and marries her. He did what God said. I don't know. Do you think he understood it? Hmm, probably not. So he goes and marries her, and they have children. Right? Think, things are looking good. And all of a sudden, she decides, I, I don't want to be married anymore. At least not to Hosea and these kids. So she went back to prostitution. And she found herself on the auction block. Being sold into slavery. And God says to Hosea, hey, Hosea. Yes, Lord? Go buy her back. You sure? <laughs> yes, we'll buy her back. And so what does Hosea do? He goes and buys her back. I, I always thought, wasn't it? That was amazing. Hey, guys, hey, guys, would you have done that? Two stripes, and you're out kind of thing. Uh, but he did. Of course, you know that Hosea is a, uh, uh, a visible, a, a word picture 
of what uh, was going on with God's people, right? And so uh, God says, okay, now, now Hosea, since you are a living picture of my, uh, my redemption, uh, just like uh, Hosea bought back Gomer from slavery, uh, guess what I'm doing with you, my people? I'm redeeming you out of slavery. And I do it again and again and again and again. But because you're becoming my bride, I'm going to do it again and again and again and again. However, here's a however. Because in that passage we read from Hosea, you see, not only is, uh, uh, is Jesus our groom getting us ready, but if you remember from Re Revelation, it says that the, the bride is making herself ready. Ooh, hold on, hold the phone. He's making us ready, and we're also making ourselves ready. Hmm. What does that mean? Doesn't he do it all? Well, yes and no. Because if you recall, what uh, John saw there uh, in the bride making herself ready were the righteous acts of the bride, or the saints. Would all the saints raise their hand? I'm not talking about, you know, St. Christopher and St. Andrew and those saints. That's a whole other story. I'm talking about the holy ones of God. If you are in Christ, you are a saint. So the righteous acts of the saints, that's what, that's what John was seeing there. The righteous acts, the actions of the saints. Church, let's get on. Let's get on in our world today. So how are we to do that in the, in the face of all this difficulty, which, again, I'm back in Hosea, sorry. Let your fingers do the walking. <laughs> back in Hosea 10. Because uh, uh, Hosea, God through Hosea, describes how bad it is, and it was bad, just like today, because the, the people of that day were trusting in their own way. <laughs> right? Just like us. Trusting in our own way. Uh, we're trusting in the multitude of our mighty men. Hey, government, save us, please. Give us money. Right? 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 right. Come on. Come on. Yeah. Same thing. Happening then, happening today. Therefore, verse 14, a tumult, a blizzard, a, a cyclone, a tumult will arise among your people, and your fortresses will be plundered. Think Things are bad. So what do we need to do? Make a long story much shorter. Verse 12 is the answer. Now, in the Hebrew, uh, you know that Hebrew and English are different. Not only do they write from uh, right to left, but uh, things are different in Hebrew. The original language of the Old Testament. So actually, in the order of verse 12, if you have it, begin with, so for yourselves righteousness. Actually, in the Hebrew, the verse doesn't begin there. The verse begins with reap, with, I'm sorry, with break up a fallow ground. Then, sow for yourselves righteousness, and then reap in mercy. So, isn't that how it happens in the farmer's field? They break up, the, 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 they, they plow the ground, they get rid of the weeds, they turn the, the sod over. Uh, that, that's what fallow means. So uh, when I was a kid, uh, one of my farmer, my dad's farmer friends said, hey, Matt, can you, uh, I've got a bunch of land that hasn't been used in years. Can you come with, and use my plow, my, my John Deere, <laughs> and plow up these fields, this, this, this fallow ground? I said, sure. It took me several days to plow up all this land that hadn't been used for years. I mean, there were little trees growing in it. <laughs> so, uh, so I plowed up the fallow ground. What does that mean to plow up the fallow ground? Well, is there any fruitlessness? That ground was fruitless. 
beads, trees, which are, you know, okay for the deer, but he said, plow it up, break it up. Yeah, get get this get this book into you. Get the get God, get my word into you. Break up the, the foulness, the unfruitfulness of your heart. Let, let me add it. I'll, I'll break it up in you as you as you yield uh, to me your heart. As you surrender your heart to me. So break up the fallow ground. Break up your fallow ground. Don't worry about your brother, your neighbor, your sister, your, your, your mother. This is, what about you? It's about your heart, the fallow ground of your heart. Right? Break up that fallow ground. And then sow for yourselves righteousness. Sow, sow some seed of righteousness. Doing things. Do, be, being about what God has called you to do. Be in, in this world. This, this world is crying out to see the church be the church. It's crying out to, to see the, the, the righteousness, the righteous acts of the saints. Sow that seed out there. Get out there. Say, well, I, I've never been to seminary, man. You know, and I, uh, and I. Our, our preacher today at the fair, at the church service at the fair, uh, he, he's a beef farmer. And he talked about the relationship between uh, cows and their calves and how it's like our relationship with us and Jesus and how uh, we are dependent upon him like a, a calf is to her. Uh, it's cow, it's mom, it's the cow. Uh, he's, he's not a uh, you know, seminary trained guy. He said, okay, God, use me. Use me, God, where I'm at. And so God did. <clears throat> so, so, uh, <clears throat> so break up the fallow ground, sow for yourselves righteousness, whatever it is that God has Maybe it's a neighbor, maybe it's a friend, somebody at school, I don't know. So, but sow some seed out there. Don't wait till uh, Pastor Duff does it. Oh, I say that? <laughs> so, sow for yourselves righteousness and then reap. Reap, 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 reap that fruit of, right, of, of mercy. For it is time for what? Verse, the end of verse 12. For, because it is time to seek the Lord. It's time, ladies and gentlemen. It's time, church, to seek the Lord. It's time to seek Him in all of this. I was listening to uh, a, a, a commentator about the thing that happened at the Olympics uh, from... Uh, No, uh, who, uh, Ken Ham, uh, uh, Answers in Genesis, like, like Answers in Genesis, and he was saying, you know, uh, we don't need to, oh no, uh, let, let's, in the face of what happened there, let's, let's be the church, let's get, get the, the word, get the word out to the hearts of people, in the face of that, because that's a, that's, this is an opportunity, it's an opportunity to grow up, be like Jesus in the face of shameful stuff. So uh, it's time. It, it, it's time. If not now, when? If not you, who? If not here, where? It's time. It's time to seek the Lord till, till, until he comes. And I, I don't think uh, Hosea is referring to just his second coming. Until uh, his, presence is, his, his presence is so powerfully real. Until he comes and he rains righteousness on you. He rains righteousness on the church. He rains righteousness on the church. Rockland Baptist Church until he rains his righteousness. Like the, the rain from Debbie the other day. Why, Debbie was full of water, wasn't she? <laughs> wow. 
until he reigns righteousness on the church. The righteous acts of the saints. So the bride is getting herself ready. Ready or not. I often wonder, what if, you know, there, there's a new contemporary song, Come, Jesus, come. Things are bad. Set things right. Isn't that a great song? Come, Jesus, come. I mean, the last part of Revelation says, Come, Lord Jesus. The, 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 the bride says, Come. The spirit and the bride say, Come. But I wonder, I, I wonder, what if Jesus is saying, I'll come when my bride. Paris, get us ready. That we might ready, be ready, ready ourselves as your bride. That you might come. That our world might see you come in and through your church. May that be so, Lord, of every one of us in this room. The bride, holy, spotless, blameless, the bride of Christ. We thank you in Jesus' name, and we say it together. Amen. Amen.